everyone. Today we will start chapter three, continuous random variables. Okay, so the main difference with respect to discrete random variables is that the PMF is now a continuous function, as you see here. Now we call it PDF instead of PMF. I'm going to define it in a minute. And then the CDF, which also has the same definition as before, now is a continuous function. Okay. All right, so given this, these two properties are very good to know. So first, that the property that x equals any given value is 0. And that's because we're defining the outcomes on the real line, and there's infinite real numbers. Okay, uh, And that has the effect that strict inequalities and non-strict inequalities are equivalent. Right, because the probability of x equal a particular number is zero. <clears throat> so in this chapter, we don't need to worry about strict inequalities or not. Right? Very good. Now the CDF still has the same definition, right, as in discrete, but now we replace summations by integrals. That's going to be kind of the main uh, difference in this chapter. So integrals, and then, of course, we need the dz in this case. Okay, so it's the CDF. Now, uh, it's the area under the curve of the PDF. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the PDF. That's the definition of it. It's the derivative of the CDF. Okay, and we call it probability density function. All right, so it's the blue curve you see here. They typically look like a bell curve, as in the picture. And that's the main formula we're going to use to compute probabilities. We're going to use the PDF, then we're going to integrate it between the two bounds, like that. Okay? <clears throat> and notice that this is this, almost the same formula as in the discrete case. So in the discrete case, we had a, a less than or equal there. But now it doesn't make a difference, so... Actually, all these are equivalent now. All right, so you can either use the integral or use the CDF. Okay, but that's the idea of probabilities now. All right, you can click on this link to see uh, many of the common or famous distributions in action. Okay, let me show you the connection between PDF and CDF. So it's obviously one is the integral of the other, but just to make it really clear, so all right, so we have the PDF here on top, which is the derivative of the CDF. So f of x like that. All right, <clears throat> which means obviously that the CDF, which is right here, right, it's the number, as we said. Now. We start negative infinity to make sure we start in the slowest, no, the lowest uh, outcome in our sample space. But negative infinity is like a safe starting place. Um, now, look, this is a typical kind of uh, ambiguity notation. You don't want to use the same variable for integration, right? So we use a dummy. I think we were using a Z before. Right, because we have x right here, so you don't want to put it there, too. Okay, so that's the relationship between the two, and this is the graphical relationship, right? So the area here is obviously this integral, except that it's between the given bounds, right? So this is the definition of f of x. Now, uh, let's define... All right, so the area in the figure shows the probability of being between these two numbers. Let's call them A and B as before. All right, so that's the probability that X will be between the two. All right, and it's going to be the area under that curve, right, um, which is also going to be the difference between these two points. So this distance, right, is also this probability, right, because... Um, <clears throat> right, this is A and B as well. So this is f of x at B, and that's f of x at A. Right? So the difference is obviously 
the probability that we were looking for. Right, so here we have the two formulas we had here for the probability, right? One is the integral and the other would be the difference in the CDFs. Okay, and here I have um, an animation. Let's see if we can make it work. So we, we're going to change the values of A and B. Oops. To see what happens. Okay, now you see it. <clears throat> All right, so I could start at a much lower value. I'm starting the, and then instead of 70, let's put, okay, so this would be um, the definition of CDF. Right, we start the integral at the lowest value, so at negative infinity, all the way up to the value x, let's say. All right, which would be right here. Now, from any value from a to b, so I'm just changing the the value of a right there, right? And I can go higher for the value of b as well, right? All the way up to the other end, or somewhere in the middle. But you see how these two change at the same time, right? Okay, so again, we can calculate these integrals or these probabilities in both ways <coughs> because they're related by essentially the fundamental theorem of calculus. Right? All right, now, since I have this animation here, let me show you what if we change the mean of this distribution. Okay, so I'm going to press the play button and see here you're going to see the mean uh, going back and forth between different values, right? So the mean of x, in this case, has the effect of changing the location, let's say, of this solid, uh, if the PDF were like a solid. Right? But the shape is the same, okay? And the probability, see how they change accordingly, right? And still the area and the dashed area. All right, so let's fix so let me press pause if it lets me. Okay. Well, it went rogue. <laughs> yeah, it's. I can't stop now. <laughs> I want to see. I want to change the standard deviation. Let's see. Okay, good. That's done it. So now I'm um, changing the standard deviation value or the variance, right? And that gives you how scattered the data are around the mean, and you see the effects on the PDF and the CDF. All right. So that's that. <clears throat> um, and actually, um, yeah, there's the formal definition of PDF, right? We've already seen it. And this is kind of important. As usual, we need the properties to add up to one. In this case, it's the area under the PDF curve that needs to add up to one, All right? So um, any non-negative function, because all the f, f of x's have to be greater than one, OK? So, all these guys have to be positive and add up to 1 when you integrate them. So that means that any function that has those two simple properties will be as CDF. OK, so one of the most important properties of the PDF is that it has units. And that can be confusing many times. So make sure you get this. So the PMF, remember, uh, gives probabilities to discrete random variables to each outcome. And that is a probability, and therefore it probably doesn't have units because it's a ratio. <clears throat> but PDF does, and that can be confusing. That means that the particular values of f of x, they only have to be non-negative, but they could be greater than 1. Could be a lot greater than one, actually. 
and it, that's because it has units. So the numbers of this function depends on the units you're measuring x. So if x is time until the next bus stop in minutes, so uh, this guy turns out to have the inverse of the units of x, right? Right here. Um, we're going to explain that in a second. But that's important because you typically think that properties have to be between 0 and 1, but then f of x is not in general between 0 and 1. What is between 0 and 1 is the probability of any interval in this case. So when you multiply by dx, that's a probability. Okay, it's it's an area under a curve, right? And that's probably that x is really close to little x in this case, right? Between x and x plus dx. So that's defined uh, dimensionless because it's a probability. And that's going to be between 0 and 1. Okay? All right, now why is this true that the units are like that? It's because uh, from here we can see it very clearly. Probability, we said, is dimensionless. So, dimless. Um, and dx has the same units of x. Right? dx is just a differential. So, it's a little interval along the x-axis. So, it has to have units of x. And then, the units of f of x, it's, it's kind of, we solve for the units here, right? Because the product has to be dimensionless. So if x f of x has the inverse of the units of x, then that is going to work out, right? The units cancel out. <clears throat> All right, so don't forget that PDFs have units and can be a, a bit uh, confusing in that way. All right. Um, the good thing is that all the definitions we know from discrete random variables, now we can apply them regardless of whether it's discrete or continuous. Once we have defined how to take expectation. Okay, so after this slide, you would see that all the formulas we've learned already, um, they remain unchanged because they're all as a function of the expected value of some functions. Right? So the way to take expected values with continuous variables is as displayed in these equations. But you can see it's very similar to the discrete case, right? It's um, before we had the summation of x times p of x. Now we have the integral instead of summation, and it's x times f of x dx, right? Because now f of x dx is the probability that x would be close to little x. Right, so f of x times dx plays the role of our old p of x for discrete. And the integral plays the role of the summations. But you see the formula has the same concept, right? So we add up the values of x times the probability of x for all values in the sample space. And the same for a function of g, x, sorry. Right, as you see it in blue here, you just stick it in the, the definition like that. And therefore, the variances, right? This is what I mean that we use the same formulas as before, right? That's the definition of variance. That's our shortcut formula. But the only difference now is they're going to use this, these two um, equations to compute these expectations that we need here. So that's the main, the main um, change, right? <clears throat> All right, and now we can do um, a few examples. Let's start with a simple one. So they're giving you a probability density function f of x. Now, typically, they're defined with brackets like that. It's to define uh, the sample space. Right? So here, this is the sample space. Right? S, let's call it Sx. Right? It's um, between 0 and 1, simply. Right? But then everywhere else has to be 0. So we're... Uh, usually going to have this sentence to be uh, really precise that outside the sample space f of x is zero so you need to be careful all right so first find the constant typically um, the way to do that is integrate the f of x make sure it adds up to one right so c equals two in this case and then compute the expected value it's just going to be the integral of two times x over the 
uh, sample space, right? So that's the definition. Here, the sample space is from 0 to 1. The function is x times 2 times x, so 2x squared, all right? <coughs> um, why don't you try to calculate the variance of x? All right, um, similar example, so nothing really new. Here we're computing variances and coefficient variations and a probability. All right, so part A is the same as before. Uh, the mean is the same, you see. For the variance, we're going to calculate the expected value of x squared to use the shortcut formula right here. And the coefficient of variation is just the ratio of the two. Right? I mean, I'm going a little fast because we've done these things so many times with discrete random variables. Um, and the same for conditional probabilities, right? This is A, B. This is the intersection divided by the condition B, right? Now, probabilities here we're doing the, um, there's the integral form, and then this would be the CDF form, I guess. Okay? So make sure we are up to speed there. Um, this one very similar, so I'm going to skip it. The Cauchy distribution is a special one. <clears throat> we're not going to use it very often, to be honest, but it has this neat property that the variance is infinite. All right? So, and actually this uh, random variable arises in practice a lot. Imagine you have these two parallel plates and you are emitting a light beam in this direction with an angle theta. All right? It turns out so if this is the distance spanned by the light beam from the center here, it turns out that uh, x will have this distribution given a random distribution for theta. It's a uniform distribution. We're going to see it in a minute. All right, but imagine just you're holding a flashlight like that and you want to measure this distance. Right? And if the angle is very close to... Um, pi over 2 here, right? Right angle. Um, this goes to infinity. X goes to infinity. All right, so um, first we yeah, calculate C. The same trick as usual. Now here, yeah, this, the integral of that is pi. So don't worry if you didn't know it. In general, we give you these kind of hints if you need it. All right. <clears throat> Then f of x is just the integral of that, right? You get that, no big deal. The problem is here, when you try to estimate the formula for the variance and expected values, right? So the expected value of this doesn't converge, right? So it's infinite. Uh, and same thing for here. So the variance is infinite. Okay, so it's uh, a pathological distribution, which I guess the, the, um, the moral is that Sometimes these variants don't exist and we don't have to take them for granted, okay? So make sure we calculate them before doing any um, any sort of, um, trying to get any sort of insights. All right, um, this is an example about the exponential distribution. So we're going to study that in more detail in the next chapter, but this is a nice uh, introduction. So this is the shape of the exponential distribution. Now, if, if you calculate the parameter lambda here, it turns out that's going to be um, 1 over 100. Right, because, because of this, right? Um, so the general shape of the exponential distribution is x times lambda here, All right? So that's kind of your exponential distribution. Lambda e to the negative lambda x, OK? Very famous distribution. All right, and here we run the probability that it's between two given numbers. So once we have that, we just take the integral of that, and that's your probability. OK, uniform distribution, very important one. Um, Again, we're going to talk about it in a lot more detail next chapter, but just to get an idea, <clears throat> so 
so yeah, this I should have done this with the exponential distribution. It looks like this. That's x. That's f of x. So it's, it's an exponential decay. Right? All right. It doesn't look like one. So um, yeah, it's more or less like that. And it's never going to touch that like this. All right. So at the beginning you have the the most, uh, and this is uh, lambda action, right? Um, right. So the lower the number, the higher the probability for exponential distributions. Now uniform, it's uniform means that it's the same probability. Now um, typically it's defined between any two numbers a and b. In this particular case, there's zero and one. And uniform means, again, it's a flat f of x right here, right? And since you want the area to be 1, this number here has to be 1, which is, um, okay, which is the number that you have here, right? Okay, so that's your uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Define here and everywhere else is 0, right? So to the left and to the right. <coughs> so when you say the integral right of the function from negative infinity to infinity, what you really mean is from zero to one. All right. Okay, and f of x is one, that's why we have this, so this would be the expected value of e of x when x is uniform. All right. Now we can talk about um, joint continuous random variables. So we're going to have x's and y's. And here again, it's very similar to the discrete case, same definitions. The only thing that's different is the way we calculate expected values. But all the formulas, you can obtain them one from the other by changing p of x with f of x. All right, so the CDF, um, it's the same definition as the discrete case. <laughs> okay, but now it's going to be the double integral of the joint PDF, right? Double integral in x and y. Or right, conversely, so now the PDF is going to be the second derivative of the CDF, like that. And now it's the double integral that has to add up to 1 here, just because we have these two random variables. Um, let me show you how they look. So they're pretty similar to the discrete case, except that now we take the limit as the bin sizes go to zero. All right, I'm trying to put this in here. All right, so that's your typical discrete random variables, right? With the bin sizes for x and y. All right, so we have x, y, and then the vertical dimension would be the probability. Okay, and when we take that limit of the bin size go to zero is when you get these continuous random variables. So they look like a mountain now in 2D. Again, we have x and y, and then the probability at... So the higher the mountain, the higher the probability at that point. Okay? And, uh, of course, they all have different shapes. It depends on the variables you have. But uh, that's the visualization of these things. Right? It's like a mountain. All right, so... The PDFs are the mountains, and then the integrals are areas under the mountain now. Okay, so to calculate the probability of any event, C in this case, um, we simply do the integral of the joint PDF in that region. All right, so that the strategy is the same as before. Any question has to be... taken to the xy plane, identify the region, whatever that might be, you know, maybe it's 
a couple lines and then this is the region. I'm just saying. Right, this this is C. And then the probability of the the question being asked is the integral in this area. Alright? The integral of the joint density. Alright, so that's the, the challenge in every question. Trying to find out what is the appropriate region to integrate. But apart from that, <clears throat> that's the main difficulty. All right, and all the other definitions, marginal, conditional probability, independence, they're all exactly the same as before, but changing. So you take the, uh, you take the formulas before, and if you change P of X, the PMF by F of X, well, these are if we change them like that, then we obtain all these formulas. All right, so in chapter two, we use PMF. In chapter three here, we use PDF. But you see the equations are, are all the same, right? The conditional probability is exactly the same, just changing the X by a P. And here again, so, we change the uh, summation by an integral, but other than that, it's the same concept. All right, so we can actually um, go right ahead and sol start solving problems. There's no new definitions, is the point. All right, so imagine then the joint PMF, <coughs> PDF, sorry, it's the mountain in the middle, and then the projections are going to be the marginals, right? They're not exactly the projections, we know they're the integrals. Right? It's kind of the row totals and column totals, remember? So if, uh, imagine the grid that you, you see there, you, you would see numbers. Now the problem is that it's an infinite grid. The cells are infinitely, or infinitesimal, right? They're very small. <clears throat> but to um, get the intuition, it's, it's okay to use the same analogy, right? Um, but visually, this is what, what kind of happens here with the marginals and the joint PMF. All right, and independence, the same definition, right? If the joint equals the product of the marginals, that's going to be the same condition that we're going to test. Okay, and expectations in two dimension is similar. So we just add one more integral, as you see here. All right, and then uh, if they ask you what is the expected value of y or x? So it's kind of a special case of this, right? When g of x is equal to y, actually. Um, you can do, apply that formula, right? So double integral of the function, in this case it's just y, times this. But if you do the, the integrals, you'll notice that this inner integral right here is nothing else but the marginal of y, right? because we're taking the integral with respect to x. And then y times f of y is the definition of expectation for y. So <clears throat> the note here is saying when you want to calculate the expected value of one of the random variables involved, if you had the marginal handy, you can go ahead and use the typical formula. Right? Now, if you don't have it, then you might as well do this. But there are two equivalent ways. Covariance, same definitions as before, as you can see. So the only thing that changes is how to compute those expected values. All right, let's do this example. Take a minute to read it, please. All right, so we have these two friends that need to meet. Um, they both... Their arrival time is both uniform for both people. So they can arrive at any minute between 0 and 60. All right? With equal probability. That's why it's the uniform distribution. Now, since they have this distribution, that's going to be the PDF of x, just 1 over the, dist one over the length. <clears throat> um, remember, because for the uniform, we said that, so in this case, it's between 0 
and 60 now, right? So if you want the area to be 1, then this has to be 1 over 60, okay? And this is f of x. And that's why we have this 1 over 60 right here. All right. And there's 0 otherwise. Okay? Now, since they're independent, and this we're going to use every time, or a lot in this in these examples. Since they're independent, they told you that the arrival times are independent, okay? Or if not, you can assume it safely in this case. Um, and that simplifies a lot because that means that it's really easy to obtain the joint density for x and y. We just multiply their individual marginals, okay? And we're going to do that a lot. So make sure you're comfortable with this equation right here, which is just the definition of independence. All right? <clears throat> so if you multiply, so f of y is exactly the same as f of x, right? So when we multiply them together, it's, we're just abstaining 1 over 60 squared. But on this sample space, which is for both x and y, has to be between 0 and 60. All right? So we have the joint... Um, PMF, P CDF, of oh, PDF, and then um, we're almost done. The only thing we need to do now is find the area or the region in X Y plane where we need to integrate this function, which is really simple. It's a constant, right? Okay, so in all these problems, you always have to make your X Y plot. All right, that's your sample space. Everything outside this is zero. The probability is zero. Okay, and typically the line y equals x is really helpful, especially in this problem. Okay, <clears throat> so what is the area that they're talking about? So, the, so first of all, the question is probably that they meet, right? Where in this... Um, in this picture, do they meet? All right, so let's say here. Oh wait, and this is 20, right? They're gonna wait um, at most 20 minutes. And they're gonna leave. Okay, so let's say a point right here. What does this point mean? So X and, and Y right here. Okay, so that means that x arrived really close to the end of the hour, and y arrived, you know, by the beginning of the hour. So, what is the, the difference in time between their arrivals? Is that greater than 20 or not? So it looks like it is, right? But let's try to see um, in the picture really that shows you what is the waiting time from one of these kids. All right, <clears throat> so, and that's where the line y equals x come into play, because you can now compare them in the same axes. So, you could say this is y as well, right? Because you went like this, through the line y equals y. Therefore, this distance, so from here to here, is the weight. So, well, maybe not the weight, is the time between their arrivals, right? And it turns out that Y is the first one to arrive, and he would wait only 20 minutes, which should be around here, if this is 20, right? And here Y leaves, because it's more than 20 minutes. <clears throat> but this is the, the relevant distance, right? If that distance is greater than 20, then the person leaves, therefore they don't meet. If that distance is less than 20, then they meet. All right, so the key is the distance. And the distance um, turns out to be, in general, is just x minus y in absolute value. Now, distance here is in time, right? But it's the distance in the graph. 
says the difference really in the time of arrival. Okay, so once you get that down, uh, you will understand that if you draw two lines here at 20 and one over here at 20, it means that if they arrive in this region, they will meet. Okay, and it's because all the points inside these regions have a distance that is less than 20. Okay? And really that's that's the whole question. Finding this area. And that's how these all these questions are. Once you find the area, then you're golden because you only need to integrate here. Alright? Um, let's try a couple of points. So a point in this line, obviously they always meet, right? Because it means that they arrived at the same time. Now a point a little to the left, let's say here, um, they will meet as well because we already know that um, the, the distance between the two, right? Um, right, we saw it was this distance, but in this case, you can also put it like that. So it's really the distance to the line that are um, these distances we need. Right, so for any given point, you draw a, the distance to the line y equals x, and that's your distance. Let me call it d. Right, that's, that would be d for that point, d for that point, d for that point. Okay? Or you can do it the vertical distances too, they're the same. Right? Okay, so that hopefully that makes it clear that um, when this is 20, that defines kind of your region where they would meet. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the, a cleaner version of the problem, right? And again, that's, that's the key idea here. But once you have that, then the rest is easy. Because we just need to integrate in this region C that we called it. Let's see. Right? And it's a constant, so it's really easy. Now, um, here we have the double integral of dx dy. And that, if you go from calculus, that's the area of the region that you're integrating. Right? Now, this is only true because we're using the uniform distribution to start with. But it's not true in general. So don't think that properties are always going to be the areas of these regions. Okay? Probabilities are going to be the area only when we use the uniform distribution. All right. So um, since it's the area, you could do it in many ways, right? You could compute first these two triangles, maybe, and then the rectangle, etc. But you're going to get 0.55 if we did it correctly. All right. Okay. Make sure you understand the example. It's pretty important. Uh, a similar one, <coughs> the sense that we start with uniform distributions. So here the question is, what is the PDF of x plus y, um, of the random variable x plus y? OK. Now, a PDF is just a probability, right? It's the probability, but for each possible outcome. So it is kind of a probability question. It comes down to, again, drawing the right graph and integrating the right function. Now, in this case, we're going to draw the right graph, but then we're going to take derivatives. To know that in this example, it's easier to compute the CDF. All right, so let's do that. Um, let me, okay, I think I can do it in this space right here. All right, so x, y. And then we're going to draw the line x plus y um, equals t, right? Because that's this is the event we need to evaluate. 
Okay, so this is important that you guys know. The equation of this line, which should be kind of symmetric, right? So this is t and this is t as well. And that that's this line is the line x plus y equals t. Alright, so that's important. So the line x equals y is important and this line is also important. All right, so the intercepts are both t here. That's the thing to know. <coughs> okay, since x plus x and y are both uniform between 0 and 1, so x plus 1, sorry, x plus y could be anywhere between 0 and 2, right? Okay. Now, the sample space, we should write down the sample space for x and y. But or, let me, there's two situations as you can see there, right? So to see them clearly, let's let's um, focus on the first one. Yeah. So if t is less than one, so it means that one is somewhere here, and one is somewhere here. And this is x. Right? T less than one. So that this is the whole sample space. Right. So the line is inside the sample space. So the probability that they're asking, right, the density actually of x plus y, so we start with the CDF of x plus y, is the probability that x plus y is less than t, right? Okay, and this is a probability where the relevant area is this one, right? That's the uh, region where x plus y is less than or equal to t. Okay? So if we do the double integral in that area, then that would be the probability we're looking for. Okay? And that's why it's uh, 1 half t squared. That's the area of this triangle, right? Of height and base equal to t. Pretty neat, right? So that's it. That's for the first case. Now, the second case is um, very similar, but now we see that t is between 0 and 1, sorry, between 1 and 2. So the number 1 could be somewhere here. So this is your sample space. Okay, let me draw this a better. All right. <clears throat> Let's say that this is the situation now. So that now this is my sample space, the square, and t happens to be greater than one, but less than two. All right. So now this triangle right here which I'm dotting, this guy is outside the sample space, so it has to, it can't be considered in the interval, right? Before, the sample space was larger, so every point below the line was considered. Now it's not. All those dotted points are not in the sample space, therefore should be removed from your interval. Okay, and so this area right here is exactly this area right there. Okay, make sure you know how to prove that, please. All right, I might ask it in during lecture. So make sure why the area of this equals that. Very good. <clears throat> so th these are two very good problems that show how the computational probability is simply translated to the computation of uh, these regions. Okay, so in this example, once we have the CDF, we can take derivatives and then answer the question, which was, was the PDF? Okay, so remember, that's the CDF. Oops. And now we just take derivative of each line, right? Before it was one half t squared, right? 
uh, derivative is t, and the other one, that's zero. Okay, and we can plot it, and you would see that this is the triangular distribution, actually. Right from zero to one, um, it, right, the slope is one, the equation is t, and this is t, by the way, and this is f of x plus y. <coughs> And then from 1 to 2, um, 2 minus t, that's the equation, and the slope is negative, right? So it's a triangle, um, and it's called the triangular distribution. Now remember when we added two dice in the previous chapter, we obtained the discrete triangular distribution, right, with uh, things like that. So this is a continuous analysis.